In the last video, we talked about expressing rates in terms of how fast a reactant disappears or a product is produced. Here we're going to go further and produce an equation that predicts what the rate of reaction will be for a given reactant concentration. We're going to use experimental data to do this. This equation is called a rate law. There's no way of determining a rate law just by looking at a chemical equation. It has to be experimentally determined. And this is done by studying how the rate changes as you change the concentration of a reactant, just as we discussed in the last video. So imagine I have a reaction and one of its reactants is called A. I vary the concentration of A and I collect some data on the initial rate for each concentration, keeping everything else constant. I then make a new graph using axes like this and I look at the shape of the graph because this can tell me some important information about the reaction. For instance, if there's a linear relationship between the rate and the concentration, this means that the rate is directly proportional to the concentration of that reactant, and we call that a first order dependence. We say that the reaction is first order with respect to A. If the rate has a parabolic dependence on concentration, you get a curve like this, then we know that the rate is proportional to the square of the reactant concentration. And we say that the reaction is second order with respect to A. It's also possible to have higher orders, third order say, or fractional orders like a half or a two thirds, but we're unlikely to meet those in this course. Another possibility is that the rate doesn't depend on this reactant at all. No matter how you change the reactant's concentration, the rate doesn't change. This is called a zero or zeroth order dependence. Note that it doesn't mean that the reactant's not taking part in the reaction, just that the rate of the reaction is not dependent on the concentration of this reactant. We can turn these proportionalities into proper equations that describe how the rate of the reaction depends on the concentration of its reactants. And this equation is called the rate law for that reaction. Each reaction has a different rate law, and each reaction's law has to be determined by running rate experiments. You can't pull it out of thin air. Before we look at some rate data, I want to show you the maths that we use to derive the rate law from experiments. The logic is simple, and it's well illustrated by some data on a geometrical shape. So for the purposes of this analogy, you need to imagine that you don't know the equation that describes the relationship between the volume of a re rectangular prism and its length, width and height. Imagine instead that you've been given this 3D object and that you can modify its length and width only, its height is fixed, and that you have to find an equation for its volume. You do some experiments, you vary the length and the width and you measure the volume and you come up with this data in the table here. You look through the data and you can see some relationships. If you look at experiments one and two, you'll see that the width was held constant, but the length was doubled. When you do that, you can see that the volume doubles also. So we can say that the volume must be proportional to the length. You double the length, you double the volume. Note this is not the same as saying it's equal to the length, it's clearly not, but rather that when we multiply the length by a factor, the volume gets multiplied by the same factor. Equally, you can see that the volume must be proportional to the width. Look at experiments two and three. When the length is held constant, but the width is halved, the volume halves. You can see a similar relationship between experiments three and four. The width is quadrupled and the volume is also quadrupled. So far so good, but we can go further. If the volume is proportional to both the length and the width, then we can say that it must be pr proportional to the product of the length and the width. Well, this makes sense. For instance, we know that the volume doubles when the length doubles and it doubles when the width doubles. So if we double both the length and the width, the volume will double and double again. That is, it's, it'll be multiplied by four. If you compare experiments one and four, you can see this happening. Alternatively, uh, look at experiments one and three. You can see that the length doubles, so that will double the volume. But you can also see that the width halves, so that will halve the volume. So the combined effect is a doubling and a halving of the volume, so it stays the same. OK, but we've got one last problem. Although we know that the volume is proportional to the product of the length and the width, it's not equal to the product of the length and the width. Looking at experiment, looking at experiment 1, clearly 2 times 5 is not 30, so there's something missing. What's missing is a proportionality constant, an unchanging value that's put into the expression to turn it into a true equation with both sides having the same numerical value. 
At the moment we don't know the value of this constant so we'll just call it k. c already means the speed of light so k is often used to indicate constant. Uh, and we write our equation like this, volume equals k times length times width. Now since we have some experimental data we can find out what k is because all we have to do is uh, substitute some values into our uh, new equation um, and divide the volume value by length times width and that will give us k. And if you look at all the data you can see that in every case volume divided by length times width equals 3. So uh, for this system the value of k is 3. So we now have an equation that expresses precisely how the length and the width of this object are related to its volume. Obviously in this particular case the constant is the height of the shape and for the purposes of this analogy I've fixed the height at 3. Uh, it could really have any value. However the point is the process of determining the equation. Looking back at our rate concentration graph you can see that we could do something very similar with rates. The rate is analogous to the volume of the shape and the concentration, the reactant concentration, is analogous to the length or the width. By varying the concentration we can distinguish between different dependencies on concentration. The rate might be directly proportional to the concentration or it could be proportional to the square of the concentration or it might not depend on it at all. And we can turn that proportionality into a proper equation by determining the constant k which is called the rate constant. So let's take this reaction as a starting point. Ammonium ions and nitrite ions can react together in aqueous solution uh, to give nitrogen gas and water. In order to determine the rate law for this reaction a chemist would do a series of experiments varying the concentration of the ammonium and the nitrite separately and measuring the rate of the reaction just as we varied the length and the width of the prism and measured its volume. And here's a question for you to think about. For this particular reaction, what would be a suitable experimental method of measuring the rate? Now in a second I'm going to ask you to pause the video and look at this data. Using the same process that we used for the prism, see what you can get out of the data. What's the rate proportional to? Can you write the full expression? Can you even figure out a constant that converts the expression into a proper equation? Okay, pause the video now and see what you can get out of it. All right, so let's go through the data. Comparing experiments one and two, you can see that the ammonium concentration was doubled while the nitrite was held constant and the effect on the rate was to double. If you look at experiments two and four, you can see that the ammonium concentration triples and the rate triples. Although, notice that the rate value appears to not quite triple. This could either be the effect of rounding off the data or it could just indicate normal variance or scatter in experimental data which are almost never perfect. Nevertheless, the data is good enough to say confidently that the rate is proportional to ammonium, the concentration of ammonium. Next, uh, let's have a look at the nitrite ion. In experiments five and six, the ammonium is held constant and the nitrite is doubled. And again, the rate doubles. Looking at the rest of the data you can find that the rate also is proportional to, directly proportional to the nitrite concentration. Now knowing these two things we can say that the rate must be proportional to the product of these two concentrations. And going further we can say that to convert this expression into an equation we need to multiply the concentrations by a proportionality constant, that's the rate constant, that will give us the actual value of the rate. So how do we find out the value of the rate constant? Well we've got our rate law here, rate equals k times the concentration of ammonium times the concentration of nitrite. So we can rearrange that equation to make k the subject, so that would give us k equals the rate over the concentration of ammonium times the concentration of nitrite. And we have values for those three variables, we've got the rate, we've got the ammonium and we've got nitrite. So we can just plug those in and that'll give us a value for k. So here I've dropped all the data from the table into an Excel file. Here's uh, my eight experiments, the ammonium concentrations, the nitrite concentrations and the observed initial rate. And I can put in an equation for the rate constant. We're saying that it equals the rate divided by the concentration of the two reactants. 
like that, and that gives us a value for the rate constant of 0 0.000270, so 2.7 times 10 to the minus 4. And if I bring this down to all the other experiments, you can see that we get very similar values all the way down. Now, you would expect a certain amount of variance. You can see they're not all exactly the same uh, because these are genuine experiments. So you're going to expect a certain amount of experimental scatter. But if we take uh, the average of all those rate constant values, then that gives us a plausible value for the true rate constant. So that's giving us 2.68 times 10 to the minus 4. So to summarize what we've got for this particular reaction, the rate is proportional to both the concentration of ammonium and that of nitrite. The rate is therefore proportional to the concentration of ammonium multiplied by the concentration of nitrite. Now to turn this expression into a proper equation, there has to be a constant that we multiply the concentrations by to give us the actual numerical value of the rate. So we rewrite the expression like this as a rate equation or a rate law. The constant that converts the expression to an equation is called the rate constant, and it's unique to a reaction at a particular temperature. It will change if the temperature changes, because as we know, temperature affects the rate of reaction, but we're going to go into that later. The rate law now shows the relationship between the reaction rate and the concentrations of the reactants. Uh, I should note here that it's also possible for gas phase reactants to use pressures instead of concentrations. Let's have a look at another example. In this reaction, two bromine atoms are uh, combining to form a diatomic bromine molecule. An experiment has been performed where the initial concentration of bromine atoms is varied systematically and the rate of reaction is measured. As you can see, for this reaction, when the bromine atom concentration doubles, the rate quadruples. You can see we go from 0.1 to 0.2 and the rate goes from 1.2 to 4.8 moles per litre per second. Uh, if you look at the first and the third experiments, you can see that when the concentration triples, the rate is multiplied by 9. And from the first and fourth experiments, you can see that when the concentration quadruples, the rate is multiplied by 16. If you line all this up, you can clearly see that the rate is not proportional simply to the concentration of bromine atoms, but instead to the square of their concentration. And if we want to convert that to a proper equation, uh, we need the rate constant as before. So it becomes rate equals kBr squared. So let's summarize reaction orders. Note that we can talk about reaction order in two contexts. We can talk about it with respect to a single reactant. That's like saying if we hold all other concentrations and conditions constant, how will the rate vary with this reactant? And we can talk about the overall reaction order, which is the sum of the orders with respect to all the reactants. Reactions with overall orders of zero or first order are simple. There's only one possible type of rate law for each. If we have a reaction with overall second order, however, there are two principal ways that this could happen. One is that the rate could depend on the square of one reactant concentration, as with the bromine atoms becoming bromine molecules in the previous slide. In this case, the reaction is second order with respect to the reactant and its second order overall. However, our ammonium and nitrite reaction is also second order overall. It's first order with respect to ammonium and first order with respect to nitrite. But when you sum those two orders together, you have an overall second order reaction, a reaction where the rate depends on two concentrations. Try this task before you come to class. I've given you some rate data. Using the skills that you've just learned, see if you can work out the rate law for this reaction and then calculate the constant K. Look at each of the reactants individually first before you put them together to make the rate law.